Hello and welcome to this University of Melbourne live stream, Britain Has Voted, Now What? I'm Annika Smethurst. So it was a stunning victory for Boris Johnson and the Conservatives in the UK's general election, which has given the party its biggest seat hall since 1987. The election result means Britain will leave the European Union by January 31 under Prime Minister Boris Johnson's Brexit deal, something he's described as irrefutable, irresistible, unarguable decision by the British people. But what are the wider implications of this election result, both in the UK and the EU, but also for the rest of the world? And what does it tell us about democracy in the early 21st century? To explore this, I'm joined by Professor Philomena Murray, Professor in the School of Social and Political Sciences and the Jean Monnet Chair at Personum, which specialises in European Union studies. Associate Professor Tim Lynch, Chair of Political Science in the School of Social and Political Sciences, and Dr Tom Daly, Assistant Director of the University of Melbourne School of Government and Director of the global online research platform, Democratic Decay and Renewal. All very qualified to talk about this election. Hello to you all. Hello. Hello. But crucially, we want to hear from you. You can ask your questions live in the comments section wherever you're watching this live stream. Facebook, Periscope and YouTube, and we'll strive to get as many of answer questions over the next hour. So let's get straight into, uh, I guess, what does this election result tell us about the UK now and more broadly about where we are in the world? Philomena? Thank you, Annika. Um, look, it really has been quite a surprise for many people. That we, you know, we're using the term tectonic even, because there has been such a, a surprise in, with the result. Um, in many ways, it was a binary choice because it was all framed around Brexit, which is the new deep cleavage within British society and British politics today. And it also was an election which was, in a sense, the culmination of a great deal of acrimony over the last three and a half years since the Brexit referendum in June 2016. So what it means is, yes, absolutely, the UK is leaving the EU on the 31st of January next year, assuming that the withdrawal agreement bill does go through the, um, the House of Commons and the House of Lords, um, which we are, of course, assuming because Boris Johnson has such a strong uh, majority. But we're also looking at a sort of a de-alignment, a pulling away from the traditional party voting. And here we actually see that two political party leaders had within their own parties quite a few people who didn't actually like them, let alone others who wanted to actually, be, for example, vote for Labour, but they simply could not vote for Jeremy Corbyn. So we have a lot of challenges really in that binary approach um, that we've seen um, within Britain today and within the UK. It's also the first election ever where nationalist voters voted for more parties than in fact for non-nationalist, for unionist parties in Northern Ireland. Quite a few changes have taken place. And Tim, what do you think about, you know, what this tells us both on a UK sense, but also more globally? Well, we're, it's easy to exaggerate the impact of any election because they are the set-piece dramas of, of, of democratic politics. But I think 2019 has got a fair claim to being certainly the most consequential of the last 30 years. I mean, think of the big ones, 1945, uh, 1987 potentially. Um, 1997, which just ushers in a, a decade of Labour power. I think 2019 could lay claim to being more consequential than all of those, because it's brought about, it seems to be a, a bringing about a fundamental realignment of British politics and changing fundamentally, as, as Philo has suggested, the nature of European Union politics. So it's hard to exaggerate the consequences of this election, uh, certainly in historical terms. Absolutely. I mean, for me, I'm re really interested in, you know, whether and to what extent the election and the campaign and politics in general in the UK right now, you know, reflects negative trends affecting democracies around the world, you know, whether that be polarisation, fragmentation, fake news, winner-takes-all politics, you know, declining trust in politics, resurgent nationalism. I'm also really interested in the integrity of the UK. You know, the election result has sort of set the Scottish and Westminster governments on a collision course over a second Scottish independence referendum. And I'm also interested in beyond the EU, how does this election result affect the UK's standing in the world? Phil, you touched on it there about the framing of this election, that it was really, you know, Brexit or not. What does it mean for, say, Conservatives that 
we're anti-Brexit or, mm. uh, you know, the more nuanced debates within the parties. Yeah. Where do they sort of align now and yeah. are they out in the mm -hmm. wilderness? Yes, they are, actually, at the moment. Many of them are. Um, those who actually left the Group of 21 because they were so dissatisfied with Boris Johnson and his plans, um, many of them did not actually get elected. Um, it's hard to be an independent in the UK political system, and it's partly the binary aspect of the electoral system, too. Um, but the serious question about conservatism um, and sort of what could be termed a less binary, less extreme form of conservatism is really conservatism is about respect for institutions. It's about respect for the continuity of power. It often is about pragmatism and incrementalism. And so what we've seen is quite a shift away from that over the last few years. And so I think there is a challenge now for what could be called moderate conservatives to try to say, look, we still believe in the Queen, the so-called um, dignified part of the Constitution, as she was referred to by Badgett, um, and also for um, the institutions because of the fact that there's been, it was considerable concern about the proroguing of Parliament, for instance, by Boris Johnson. So those concerns are not going to go away, even for those who have left the party. Conservatism is still an important force within the UK itself. Tim, I wanted to talk to you about what this means, I guess, for um, touching on that, say, the Dem Democrats looking to the US. Ooh. What does does it say? You know, what lessons can they, I guess, learn from the the Progressive Party in the UK? And what does that mean going into twenty twenty to challenge someone like Trump? What yes. sort of parallels can we draw between the two? I think it's an excellent question, and you could even expand it to to look at. Uh, Morrison's victory in Australia, what does the victory of right of centre parties mean for, for Democrats in, in 20? I think some of the parallels are profound, but the analogy is, is not, a, not a perfect one. <coughs> I, I think in the, the, issue that set, that, that, uh, the issue of Brexit doesn't quite map onto the American system. So many Brexiteers, despite this caricature of them being little in Englanders xenophobes, were actually motivated by free trade and the idea of uh, the Britain uh, come, uh, again restoring its global trading uh, character and ambitions. And that's the opposite of Donald Trump. He believes in, in, in uh, protectionism. <laughs> he believes in trade war. So I think that separates them. In terms of uh, the lessons for the Democrats, I think if they haven't learned from Hillary Clinton's disastrous campaign of 2016, Johnson's victory in the UK should absolutely affirm that lesson, that, the, that you walk away from your traditional white working class base at your peril. If you believe that the coastal elites, or to extend the analogy, the Islington elites in, in London, in the UK, uh, are, are the arbiters of what's moral uh, in politics, you're onto a loser. You've got to respond to those constituencies that these two parties, Labour particularly, exist for. Um, and the Democrats, I think, those pragmatic Democrats that want to win will look at this victory and say, we've got to do the same, we've got to move back towards those traditional constituencies and even and move away from some of the identity politics, the, the concerns of the coastal elites that have, have uh, negated our message. So I, I think Democrats will be watching very, And very we are carefully. seeing that a little bit here in Australia. As you say, post-May, we've seen Anthony Albanese and, and many others jump to Queensland and to try and go back and find, I guess, you know, what went wrong with traditional bases. Is it as simple as left-wing parties, you know, just going too far to the left? Is that yes, the main so the, thing? I mean, we can, we can argue about this, but there is, a, I think, a, what's common across all these polities, US, Australia and the UK, is a notion that there is a... I mean, it's a caricature, but it, as that all like all caricatures, it embodies a mm. certain truth, that there is a metropolitan elite that is determined to tell the rest of the population how to live when it comes to climate change uh, and gender parity and, um, and free trade and all the other issues... On, 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 of, of this globalised elite that have transferable qualifications, telling people that are rooted and don't have those things how they should live. Now, I'm not validating that particular critique, but it's a powerful one if you feel one of the dispossessed, either in Queensland or in, in, uh, in Manchester or in Wisconsin, indeed. And, Philo, I'll just bring you in on that. We did mm -hmm. see some traditionally Labour seats that yeah. have changed hands. Mm, that's right. Um, how do, how does how do Labour come, recover from that? How do they get those people back? Or is it the case that, you know, 
those people are now lost. They're That's conservative right. voters. Yeah, look, I mean, Labour was trying, was appealing to the working class, but and it was even appealing to the precariat, that is, the precarious people who don't even have a sense of being mm. the working class and the lower socioeconomic um, groups we, who have, um, you know, zero hour contracts, who have very great deal of insecurity, no social <coughs> welfare at all. So it is appealing to the victims of austerity in many ways, but it wasn't a very clear message, despite the overlay of uh, or the, the, the strong approach of we've got to save the NHS, the national health system. Rather, what you had was a very equivocal approach by Corbyn with regard to Brexit, where he refused to actually come down on a position and sat on a fence for sure. the last three and a half years, where his key message that I am for the many, we are for the many, not for the few, really, in a sense, got eclipsed out. It didn't help, of course, that he didn't get the same sort of attention in the media as, as um, his, op his opponent. But I think that's only part of the issue. Tom, I'll just let you jump in there. You yeah. If I could just jump, jump in on that. I think one of, the, one of the things that sort of links the US and the UK here is we're not just talking about tussles between the same old parties. The parties have been taken over to a certain extent by different wings that were not in control before. And so what you have is sort of a very different creature than what you were dealing with five years ago or 10 years ago. Um, sometimes that has led to a much more exclusionary approach and a, a focus on ideological or sort of message rigor and rigidity um, rather than the broad church party of old. And I think that's a huge shift that we're seeing right mm. now. Except in, in the UK, we've now seen the rebirth of one nation conservatism, which in some ways says it's, it's, it says it's more pragmatic, not ideological. Brexit wasn't ideological. Brexit spoke to notions of national identity sense of rootedness, a sense of democratic legitimacy, that if you vote for one thing and then Parliament says you can't have it, the system falls into, uh, into disrepute. I don't think it, that's, that's, that's the, an advent of a new ideological politics, which is why the people of Redcar, and the people of Bassett Law and, uh, and uh, Doncaster were prepared to cross the ideological lines mm. and, vote, and vote blue. Which was an, an, a massive sort of change. But I would sort of push back a little bit on that to the extent that, for example, the, the people who were pushing against the government's line in the Conservative Party were denounced as traitors. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not reflective of a broad church, pragmatist, one nation Conservative Party, to my mind. Yeah. I think there was a great deal of zealotry. If you don't want to call it ideology, the zealotry, I think, was really quite exclusionist. And I think you could see this in the rejection of the, you know, Blairism and its um, uh, successors um, in the Labour Party. And we could see it with the rejection um, within the Conservatives of um, some of the, you know, the people like even Keir Starmer, who remained, but was nevertheless isolated. And talking about national identity, Tom, it was something you touched on earlier about Scotland. And we've had a, a question come in on Twitter from Chris Courtney saying, what are the thoughts on Scottish succession now, taking this vote into account? I mean, the, the whole question of Scotland is really central, but it hasn't been a central focus, as much of a focus as it should have been. When you look at the electoral map, the result map, all of Scotland is virtually yellow in Scottish <laughs> National Party yellow with a few little dots of, you know, red and blue for the for Labour and the Conservatives, the last sort of redoubts of, of those parties. And what that means is the Conservative win is in many ways an England win. Um, and we Wales. see this huge... And Wales. And Wales mm -hmm. But there's a, there is a, a very stark fragmentation in the polity that we call the United Kingdom, which is not a one-nation state, but a union state of four constituent nations. Mm -hmm. And I think... What the election result has actually copper fastened is that the Scottish National Party is here to stay and they are going to push, push, push for an independence referendum because they claim they have a mandate for it. And Philip, what do you think about that? Um, I, th I think, first of all, there is, it isn't just four nations within the, um, the UK, because if you actually look at identity, we're looking at a number of other types of identity. And um, we have seen, for instance, um, accusations of anti-Semitism of both pol political party leaders, for instance. Um, we have seen accusations of anti-Muslim uh, sentiment um, and indeed terrible remarks made by Boris Johnson. So I think what we've got is actually different types of cross-cutting cleavages of identity here. And it's not just about everyone in Wales thinking the same way or in Scotland. Scotland. But um, the fact that the um, Conservative Party went down to six seats um, in Scotland is just incredible. And, and it really is a, it's something they've got to now reconsider this.
Tim? Yes, I, I think no, I mean Scotland's a crucial part that often gets left out of the the Conservative victory narrative. But it, we, we deal with Scottish nationalism as if it's the nice nationalism, and they dress it up as a kind of fuzzy pro-EU and we love everyone. And, and forget that part of its hard edge is just a kind of xenophobia towards the English. So the SNP only exists because it's in union with the, the, the with, with, uh, with, with, with uh, England and Wales and Northern Ireland. Uh, but it, the nasty nationalism, as it's often caricatured, English nationalism, mm -hmm. in some ways, remarkably, that's been neutered by this election, that the Brexit party didn't perform. Mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't happened on the continent. The rest of the EU has nativist, far-right parties on the rise because the EU it doesn't provide that kind of escape valve. So I think in some ways, Johnson's victory, and we can argue about you know, his, his personal predilections and his political correctness, but in some ways, he very effectively neutered the far right. Extraordinary achievement in some ways. So, Look like you want to jump in yeah, there. So I would really have to jump in on that point because for me, it's not so much that Yes, to a certain extent, um, Boris Johnson has managed to neuter the far right. But for me, it's also a story and a question about whether by, he's done that by stealing the clothes to a certain extent of the far right and turning the Conservatives into something more like a far right light party, the kind of party that sort of won right. victories right. in... Far light right is centre right. Well, you know, there are elements in terms of, you know, let's, you know, look at the, the idea of prorogation, the unofficial motto of whatever it takes, um, the attacks against the BBC right after the win, um, the, the elements of the uh, manifesto, the Conservative manifesto, that suggest a review of everything from the courts to the prerogative and so on. You hear that, and if you're somebody who deals with, and I'm not for one second saying that Boris Johnson is a dictator or a wannabe dictator, but you, you hear that and you see these very, very ugly resonances with Hungary and Poland, for example, where you get a party that takes power um, and is democratically elected and wins according to the rules of the game. I'm not saying anything against the mandate that has been won, but that has a sort of uh, open season on institutions oh, wow. and, and, and will do anything to win power and take power. And I think that is of huge concern to a lot of people. Now, I think it's still a very contested um, issue, and I certainly am not planting my flag saying he is a dictator. But what I do think is these are questions we have to very much, once again, place centre focus. Do you look like you want to well, jump I, in? I, don't, I just don't, <laughs> don't agree with that. There's, if you look at the far right as if it's monolithic across all the member states of the EU, I think you're going to have big problems. And Hungary has a very peculiar, particular style of right-wing reaction. But the reaction is, is the important thing that it's a reaction against the European Union, not exclusively, but largely. And Boris's win has ob ob uh, uh, avoided that, has, has subverted that. So there's no longer a foil for the far right to run against. But is it a case that we're seeing right-wing parties take the Republicans or even here, that there is increasing tax on the institutions and that is how they're sort of, I guess... It's a very profound defence. If you're Boris Johnson, the whole argument against the EU is that it denies the historically validated power of the British Parliament. And there's a certain irony here, of course, that if you're anti-EU, what you want is, is uh, it, during this Brexit imbroglio, you wanted to go round Parliament, which for 50 years the Tories, have, the, the, the Tory Eurosceptics have been saying you shouldn't do. So it did change, uh, it, did, it did force parties to, to, to reimagine their, their position on, on things like Parliament. Philip, what do you make of that? The EU has not undermined the British Parliament. The British Parliament, um, and indeed the British political system, is part of the decision by the EU, by the UK, and the 27 other countries of the um, European Union to join and to decide on what areas they would actually do what's called pooling sovereignty. In other words, making joint decisions on agricultural prices, for instance, joint decisions on um, aspects of industrial policy of services, for instance, um, and deciding to have free movement of goods, free movement of services. Uh, free, free movement of capital, right of establishment of banks. None of these undermined the British Parliament. The second point I'd like to make is that um, the, the illiberal states, because I actually am reluctant even to call them liberal democracies, because I don't think they're democracies in um, hung Hungary, for instance, and Poland, they are not saying they want to leave the EU. Absolutely not. And 
the um, support for the European Union, for membership of the European Union in every single country apart from the UK is at an all-time high for two decades. So assuming that populism is anti-European Union is, I think, eliding the issue slightly and not actually understanding the complexities of populism and its appeal to the anti-elite um, uh, you know, support, um, but also the fact that so-called strong uh, quasi-dictatorial but certainly autocratic leaders are evident in at least two members of the mem of the um, European Union. I'll hold off on <laughs> thinking about Boris Johnson in those terms for the moment. Phil, I'll stick with you for a minute though. What does this mean for, I guess, Britain's relationship with the EU? Boris yeah. Johnson has a mandate now. Mm -hmm. Does that mean mm -hmm. he can do whatever he wants? We've had a question on Twitter come in about yeah, that. Do, yes. What sort of power does it give him in these negotiations? Yeah. Look, um, he's already actually given in on one of his red lines, um, you know, before the election. And that was actually the deal um, which he put to the parliament, which was rejected um, just before he prorogued parliament and then called the election. So he really uh, is going to be basically one into 27 doesn't go. Um, he is going to have to deal with 27 political leaders in the individual countries, plus the European Union institutions, which particularly the commissioner, um, Commissioner Barnier, who has the role to negotiate with him. If he wants to go in and get the deal done by the end of, of 2020, it is not going to be able to cover all of the alignment issues that the UK needs in order to function because there are 759 major agreements that they now have to leave, copy or amend. There are over 22,000 pieces of legislation that they have to keep, retain in some way, amended or not. This is not done in a day or two. And I have spoken to the, some of the negotiators in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and elsewhere when I was in London a few months ago. I think this is a huge, huge challenge. They want to get something like Canada. That took five years. Five years. And the EU is not going to say, we will give you everything that you want if it doesn't suit us and if it undermines other member states, particularly France. Okay? Macron is very clear on this because they do not want other countries to then say, we want as good a deal if we ever join, or countries that are thinking of leaving, which aren't at the moment, but they could, we can't tell what Hungary's going to do, well then they'll say, we want what they're having, as it were. Um, so I think there's going to be a major challenge. He is going there with actually speaking with one voice rather than having to think about the several voices behind him. That's absolutely true. That will add to his strength. Mm, yes. But I really think he needs to think about the 27 countries, including his nearest neighbour, which he has managed to insult in so many ways um, over the last um, year particularly, and France. And I would certainly be looking at Germany too. Tim McAdoe, you wanted to jump in there. Yes, what does well, it mean I, for I, I share, and I'll defer to my, my colleague's expertise on the technocratic question. The, the EU, of course, has a vested interest here in making sure Brexit at a political level is as protracted and as difficult as it's already been, because mm. they don't want to establish a precedent for other countries to make the break. But by the same token, the economic argument is that they must do a deal because Britain is such a key trading partner. So it, it's marrying, it's always been a, a basic tension within the European Union. Do you prioritize wealth or do you prioritize the project? Well, Johnson's, he's made that project, problematized that project. How much more should we try and make it hard for him versus the argument that we need to cut a trade deal. And I think, ultimately, the interests uh, in, in Paris and Berlin will bow towards the, to, towards the economic. Um, but you know, politics is, it, the process has to be made as intractable as possible in order that other, other countries don't entertain the idea. I don't think it's going to be intractable. I, I think there are distinctions to be made there though. So for me, I think the process was more drawn out because the UK government was failing to come up with plans. Every time mm -hmm. they would go back to Brussels, they wouldn't have a plan. Diplomats, negotiators were tearing their hair out. Um, but, you know, sort of that can be quibbled about, you know, back and forth. Um, but I think, you know, what the UK is not grasping about the EU in all of these negotiations in terms of the, the solidarity that has been shown by the 27 is that the EU is a peace project, not just an economic yeah. project. And that is always a part of the equation that the UK nego negotiators have not fully grasped. Um, and I think what, what 
flows out of that as well is why the EU has taken such a strong stand on the Irish border question. Because it's a peace question, it's an integrity of the EU question, but it's also who do we, who do we back if it's a, an issue between a, a departing member and an existing member who's here to stay? You go with the one that's here to stay. And Tom, I'll stick with you on that, looking even further afield than the EU. We have a question from Troy on Facebook. What does this election mean for the UK's position in the world, this outcome? I think it's a really important question. I mean, there are a number of different tiers to it for me. One is sort of the immediate reputation damage that has been caused by Brexit. Not as a project. I think there could have been a, 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 a better sort of rollout of the Brexit plan, right? Um, but you, know, you leave a huge trading partner, you lose influence. Um, you lose your influence with the US because you're not at the heart of the EU anymore. Um, but more widely, I think, you know, if the Scottish independence question actually comes to a head um, and there is some sort of breakdown of the territorial integrity of the UK, we're talking about the UK losing its permanent seat in the Security Council in the UN. Um, already diplomats talk about the trepidation index, you know, that other countries were thought twice about, you know, going against the UK's interests and that trepidation in index has really sort of lessened because they've seen that nothing really happens when you go against UK interests, um, if, you're, if you're united, especially uh, in, the, in the EU context, but in other contexts too, because we're now in a world where it's about the big beasts. It's a rising China, it's a rising India, and it's the EU as one of the biggest blocks in the world. Philo, what do you think? How will this UK exit change both Europe and the world? Look, the UK has often been regarded as a, an awkward partner or an awkward state within the European Union. It was able to get a huge amount of um, opt-outs when it um, was a member of the um, European Union, partly because it didn't share a lot of the narratives and partly because it didn't share a lot of the goals. But because it was considered to be valuable in some ways, it was stayed in. Now, as um, Xavier Bettel, the Prime Minister of Luxembourg said, well, first of all, they wanted all these opt-outs while they were in, now they're leaving, and they want all these opt-ins even though they're leaving. So I think there is going to be a challenge there. The second thing is I think the UK is going to have to get used to being a middle power. It's got to get used to it, however disinclined it is to accept that self-understanding. And that's going to be a challenge as well. It will not be part of a, um, an economic and political bloc of over half a billion people, but rather it will be dealing with having to negotiate deals where it has actually undermined relationships. Trust building is going to be tremendously important because over the last three and a half years, we have seen that the government under whichever leader has not actually stuck to its principles and stuck to its promises. And this is, and also hasn't been prepared quite often. So I think this is a challenge, you know, that there really needs to be a building up of trust once again. And that, and that will not be as a major leader. And there, you know, building, already India has said, actually, we don't really want to discuss trade with you. You know, there are going to be challenges with the, the larger powers and the emerging powers and, and in dealing with great power rivalry it will not be part of the European Union although it will still be in NATO. Mm. You look like you want to jump yeah, in there Tim. I've got another some, one but start with that. Some, some of that I, 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 I agree with but both my colleagues but much of it I don't. I, I, just, just very quickly I think that the whole peace narrative is a misnomer. Europe's been at peace because it's operated under an American security mm. guarantee nothing to do with the European Union. The European Union was just simply a way of containing German power. Um, now, you might say that's part of the peace argument, um, but I think that containment is far more explained by the application of American economic military power into Europe than, than anything organic from the structure of the European Union itself. I, and I'd also just correct the, the rather gl gloomy predictions that Britain can't exist as a separate country on its own. I mean, I, I'm reminded of debates we have in Australia about we can't possibly be a republic because we're not, we're not, we're not capable. We, we lack that independence. We need, we need to be part of something larger. Now imagine making that, it seems to me that's, that's the same argument we've heard about the EU, that rather than be part of this imperial project run from Brussels, the, the, the British, in an overwhelming majority, decided to, to go back to the independent path it had for, for a thousand years. So it seems to me far more in tune with British historical development. Um, and it's the EU which is the historical exception, except we've, we've made the argument the other way around. 
that touches on the next question we've had come through on Twitter by an anonymous uh, tweeter. What do you think this means for, you know, it's been talked about as the demise of the UK or the EU in, in your argument. Do you think this is the end well, the, for the EU? The, the demise is strong of, of either entity. It means death. I've always, I've, uh, uh, my strong prediction is that the EU will collapse a long time earlier, much earlier than, than, than Britain will collapse, although we, we're in for a rocky period, certainly in terms of, of movements in Ireland and Northern Ireland and, and, uh, and Ireland. But I think as a project, if you looked at NAFTA, this is not a perfect analogy, of course, to the EU, but NAFTA seemed an accomplished part of political life in North America for nearly 25 years. And it was reasonably quickly unpicked by, the, by, the, by Donald Trump. And now they've got a different trade deal. The EU recognised as simply a set, a set of trading economic arrangements. Seems to me, it seemed to me entirely uh, reformable. The problem is the imperial might, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but the notion that it must consume more and more political power of its members and expand itself. That, the, the historical precedents for that are that they grow and then they collapse. That's the nature of empire. Phil, what do you think about that? Do you think this is the mm. end of the EU? It's, in, and it's interesting um, hearing Tim talk about the European Union, you know, taking on power, etc. when in fact the European Union consists of 28 states who make the decisions in relevant institutions. Um, uh, so I'm really interested in who exactly it's taking the power away from, um, because it's actually the 28 countries who run the European Union. They do it within institutions. There are some that are more independent than others, um, such as the Commission. Um, but you know, decisions are made by national representatives, by and large, particularly in what's known as the council. So that's my first point. I think you're absolutely right, Tim, that um, the EU is in many ways an aberration. It is, precisely because it is built on consensus and compromise and not on conflict. That's precisely why it works. And I, don't, I, and I also think that the importance of the United States as a security guarantor has been undermined in re recent narratives of the European Union, actually, far more in the last mm. few years. However, having said that, I don't think that's the only reason that the European Union has managed to have peace. The French and the Germans are no longer killing each other. The Irish and the British managed to sit together to discuss issues relating mm. to Northern Ireland. The Germans and the yeah, Poles... The, well, actually the troubles were quieted the very, now the very by first, American intercession. Now, long before Clinton... Troubles map were, against so the yeah. framework yeah, of the Good Friday Clinton. Agreement is based on a fundamental understanding that you can ally the border across Ireland by both states being within the EU, it's integral to that agreement. Well, I, don't, I, mean, I think that's contributory. So, I don't think it's explanatory. But I mm. the, the application of US power into that conflict was the decisive feature of the peace process. Yeah, it absolutely was sort of, you know, a combination of the two. But I think the EU, without the EU, it would have been very hard to find an alternative way of doing that, right? So, but I want to return to the just ex existential crisis question because what's important to understand is Brexit and the UK leaving the EU, it's sad, it's at times an irritation for EU leaders, but it is not an existential threat. Mm -hmm. The existential threats are actually the rule of law crisis in Poland and Hungary because the EU is fundamentally a rule of law polity um, or you know, structure. But what's been interesting is Brexit itself has led to a big increase in uh, vo voter sentiment towards the EU, across the EU, because people have seen it has sort of had the effect of um, reminding people that the EU is actually in many ways a good thing. But I think what the EU needs to, and especially the EU bureaucracy, needs to learn from Brexit is it needs to look at reform. But Tom, that comes to a question we've got on Facebook. What does the EU look like now? What does it look like post-Brexit? I mean, one of the, when, when I'm looking at it as an Irish citizen, it, one of the things that is a big change is that you lose a big native English speaking member. That changes how language is viewed within the EU. It changes the character of the EU to more like a continental project, just because you have that gap there between Scandinavia and continental Europe. But, um, but I don't think ultimately, because there's a lot of political will to make it work, I think without Britain and the, without the UK in the equation, I think the EU will do just fine, really. Um, you know, you see a lot of the EU states are relatively small, and so they do need some sort of mechanism to band together. It's a pragmatic choice. Mm -hmm.
Moving on to, I guess, away from Brexit a little bit and more the UK, what it's going to look like. We've mm -hmm. had a question come in from Joanne on Twitter. Mm -hmm. What sort of leader do we think we'll see in Boris Johnson? This is somebody that was a mayor that's, um, I guess, very popular and, and into popular stunts. We saw him drive a bulldozer through, you know, a Ooh, bunch of blocks yeah. just before. Mm. Sort of, is, what sort of leader will he be compared to recent leaders we've had? Well, if you, I, I think the contrary, whether you like him or not... The contrast with his immediate successor, in fact, probably the three predecessors, Brown, uh, Cameron and May, is quite marked mm. that this is a man who we know a lot about because he's been writing and telling us what he thinks for the last 40 years. So there's a treasure trove of editorials from all sort, uh, addressing all sorts of issues. He's also had a successful two-term running uh, one of the world's great cities, London. So it's not as if he's a neophyte. Uh, what we find jarring, I think, uh, is that he there's a there's a degree of I'll call it political incorrectness. There's a degree of not passing, not concealing. There's not that technocratic. He's often put hauled over the coals for not having a grasp of detail, but he's quite explicitly defined himself as the big picture style leader. He wrote a book about Churchill. He idealizes Churchill, like many. Uh, British Conservatives, and I don't want to say he's a Churchill, but he does understand the nature, the, the, how the character of a leader can unlock issues in a way that the more technocrat technocratic approach of his predecessors simply couldn't. Well, there's been allegations he perhaps pay plays up that persona in, in a way that, I guess, but what is playing real? into... Who is real? I mean, what... Playing into it Trump's seems success, to though, he you know has a lot of those similar characteristics. Yes. Not very politically correct. Yes. Uh, do you but think that, there's an element without of endorsing, that being without a in, thing in, endorsing particular positions that he said, and this applies to Trump as well, he does represent the force of character in politics. I think Barack Obama did this as well. A very thin record. It was it was my who I am is why you must elect me. Well, both Obama, Trump, and Boris are in that that tradition. And what do we think about that? How that plays into Australia? Well, could I go back to just to his character? Um, I'm reminded of Barbara Tuchman's book, um, The March of Folly, you know, about these leaders who thought that they were terrific leaders, but in fact ended up um, uh, bringing about considerable damage to their own country. Um, the accusations against <coughs> Boris Johnson of, of lying and of making things up, including when he was a journalist for which he was sacked, um, will not necessarily go away. Politician he that is lies. deep he, when he's a journalist. Terrible. When he was a journalist. When he's a, a journalist that lies. But do those things not in stick his anymore? reports? <laughs> well, this is the question. Do they know? He also has made statements which are anti Semitic and which are anti Muslim. He has made fun of people who are dealing with difficulties in their societies. He has undermined the serious issue of that four-year-old child on the floor um, in the NHS, which was in the last few days of the election. He has accusations of sexism and of racism against him. To me, this is no Churchill, and Churchill is not my favourite character either. But nevertheless, I think what he has is an opportunity. This afternoon, I wrote a wish list for what I'd like Boris Johnson to do. And I thought one nation could, in fact, be bringing together the other parts of the United Kingdom and actually fixing up the NHS and actually dealing with poverty and dealing with the impact of austerity. That he has this great opportunity, because, precisely because he's so powerful, that he could actually take on board some of the Labour Party concerns, but also the concern of so many people, some of whom did and some of whom didn't vote for him, concerns about poverty. The fact that the UK has over 2,000 food banks, 2,000, more than any other country in Europe, okay? There are millions of people going to food banks on a regular basis in the UK. I think he has an opportunity to actually be brave and bold and deal with those issues. And so Tom, remarks. bringing you in a little bit there on, I guess, what this does mean about what voters care about. And we even mm -hmm. saw it here in Australia with not many other sort of cabinet ministers involved with the, alter, with the election campaign. It was a one-man show and it was very much proposed as between you know, a, a choice between Scott Morrison and Bill Shorten. We see it in the way Donald Trump you know, runs his campaign. What do you think there is a shift that perhaps for too long we've we've assumed that voters care about, I guess, the party or the ideal when really having a strong leader, a character, is proving to be, you know, a, a, a successful sort of path for democracy? Yeah, I think it's one of the biggest sort of questions of politics today is how to a certain extent, the political party has transformed 
from, well, in its ideal form, you know, uh, an incubator for rational policy contestation and formation, and it has become something more akin to a vehicle for emotiveness, for certain sort of messaging, for an exclusionary nationalism in many places. And what that does is you often get, you know, a charismatic leader or a, a leader who seems authentic, who says, I can... I can reach to the, to the voter, I understand what the voter wants. I, you know, the, t the, the test of who would you like to go for a beer with. But I think that actually leads into a lot of these leaders, they're unserious politicians. And it's one thing to be, to not have a huge grasp of detail. It's another thing for me to have a level of mendacity and unseriousness that shows that you really cannot actually deal with quintessentially um, troubling questions. For example, when asked about the border at one point, the Irish border question, you know, Boris Johnson said, the border is no different to the border between two boroughs in London. You know, that is not a serious question. That is not a I'm big picture um, answer. It's, it's, you know, that is just a very troubling response that, that it, for a question that requires a much more considered response. And we do have a few questions about that um, on Facebook. One from Lisa says, what does this mean for the border with Northern Ireland, this result? So I'll continue with you just to, uh, on that one, Tom, since you touched on it. Yeah, I mean, it comes back to what is the deal going to be, you know, with the EU? I mean, some people are saying that um, given the lack of command over detail, for example, and the wish to get Brexit done, that actually Boris Johnson is, is uniquely placed to achieve the sort of closer to Canada or Norway sort of option than any of his predecessors. Um, and that what that would lead, lead to would be enough alignment that the border issue will sort of be addressed. Now, whether that happens or not is a completely different question. Phil, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that one aspect is this alignment on the, the movement of goods, for instance, and the, the, the terrible problems about having to actually, every time you move goods um, or animals north and south of the border in, in the uh, island of Ireland, but also across um, from uh, Great Britain to, um, to Northern Ireland, you've got, you're going to have a massive amount of bureaucracy and the British government report has said that um, very clearly. Clearly, The second issue is the peace issue. Mm -hmm. 3,000 people died in Northern Ireland in what's called the Troubles. Some of the best surgeons in the world were in the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast and many other places like that, putting people back together again. Thousands upon thousands have actually got, st are still bearing those scars, physical and emotional and psychological. What we do not want is a return to the past. So it isn't just about goods, interesting as that may be, and it's not just about close alignment, which I think Boris Johnson could actually do. It's actually about ensuring that that peace agreement of just over 20 years can be adhered to because Northern Ireland is a fantastic and a really exciting place, but it also has got, still got those tensions. And I would worry about the binary nature also in the Northern Ireland that actually should be of, of conflict and of acrimony, which needs to be toned down. So I think that Boris Johnson has an opportunity to deal with this, mm. but to, uh, to date, I can't see any evidence that he's taken this seriously. Tim, how do you think, do you think he will take it seriously? We had his sort of comment about, you know, what he thought of the border during the campaign, but yeah, do you think so he's I, willing I, to I just have, take I mean, it I, I understand my, my colleagues put their position very well. I just. I can come up with as many ex examples of leaders that are supposed to have a good grasp of detail and are technocratic, leading to catastrophic failure. I think Tony Blair on the Iraq war. I mean, a guy that was well across policy and process, um, and it didn't, didn't end well. And there's no guarantee that a character will give you progress and that a technocrat will give you the, the, the opposite. Um, on the Irish border, of course, it's a, it, Ireland has a much longer history, of course, than, than simply the... the the border that, because it recognises an EU, uh, it's an, because it's an EU border. I think we, one can exaggerate the effects on peace between uh, the communities within Northern Ireland by exaggerating the, the fact of the technical question over the border. Um, I think this is in, in some ways requires a technical solution rather than a ramping up of the drama in, inherent to the to this troubles period which we now co comfortably have moved out of. So I, I, I think this remains an issue, but whether you could actually, 
negate Brexit on the back of the technical questions over the Irish border, I think it was always going to be a stretch for the Remain camp. It's not a technical question. No? No, it's not a technical no, question. Not, I, think I think that is very much a perspective because we know that in Great Britain, the uh, lack of understanding of Northern Ireland um, is, is something that really must be dealt with. And I think if bureaucrats are attempting to find some solution which could be regarded as technocratic, well, I say good for them. Yes, I'm arguing But on it. the other hand, um, the fragile peace in Northern Ireland is not something that should actually be talked under. No, I, 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 I just don't. We, we yep. can argue all, all day about this. No, no I'm not. I think, I, I, I think the Agility is exaggerated. Well, I don't if think I can it offer is. A I'll, give Tom, I'll give Tom the last on this because we will have to move yeah. forward. But. Just to illustrate the fragility of the peace in Northern Ireland, a, a fact that a lot of people don't appreciate, and certainly not in the Westminster government, is that there are twice as many peace walls now in Belfast keep, to keep communities apart mm -hmm. than in 1998 when the Good Friday Agreement yeah. was, mm -hmm. was, uh, was, was made. And that is well, a stark, stark reminder. Important. These are borders within Northern Ireland. They're not specific. They're emblematic of the fragility the of the a, peace a, that was achieved in 1990. No, I think, that one. I think you want to dramatise where, where it shouldn't, you shouldn't be dramatised. Something we all agree on a little bit more is trade. Now, of course, the UK are going to have to um, go in, into, into a number of free trade agreements with different countries, one of them being Australia. There's a lot of, uh, you know, possibilities out there. I think saw some reporting today that perhaps even being able to work uh, have better visa arrangements, although I don't think that's something the Australian government are too keen on. Philo, I'll start with you. What does this mean for Australia in terms of trade with the UK? Australia has a long history um, with the UK. It's a cultural one, it's a historical one, it's got institutional similarities in many ways. Um, in many ways it has been uh, referred to by politicians um, as a type of motherland. Um, so the UK and, the, and Australia have got a long history. Um, however, um, I think that the Australian government is going to be hugely pragmatic and hugely realistic and is going to continue doing what it's doing at the moment, which is negotiating a free trade agreement with the European Union. And it has already um, passed many of the difficult stages. There are still a few more rounds to go at least, and we will see challenges there. But Australia is in this really lucky position where it's at its best stage, its best phase ever in its relationship with the European Union. It signed another agreement called the Framework Agreement, which is provisionally applied at the moment. So really, this is quite, this is absolutely amazing, given the hostilities and acrimony in the past. But I think Australia can also look at what type of agreements that it has with the EU that it would also like to, in a sense, map onto its relationship with the um, UK. So what it's already done in an Australia-UK working group is actually signed up to, but it can't actually ratify it, a wine agreement, a supply of nuclear energy agreement, um, a, a mutual recognition agreement. So what the Australia wants to do is to get what it has with the EU, including the UK, also separately and in parallel with the UK. The problem is that the UK accounts for, well, about 3.5% of Australian trade, but the U Australia only accounts for 1.4% of, of UK trade. So the UK is going to have to be looking elsewhere. And, and if it's looking to other parts of the Commonwealth, that's 9% mm. of its trade. So really it's going to be, the, Australia is going to be observing quite closely what is happening in the relationship between the UK and the other 27 countries. But at the moment, I think it's in a very, very good position. Tim, what do you think about this being a, a golden opportunity for Australia? Well, I think we are, I love Australia, I'm an Australian, um, but I think we exaggerate our importance in the, uh, the economic dynamics of this. I think it's, the EU is of course a really important market for, for Australia, but I, th I think the idea that uh, DFAT is, is now deeply concerned about where its loyalties lie, I think it will, it's a pragmatic trading nation, much in the way that Britain aspires to be again, and it will be able to, it will seek to cut deals with, with both entities. For some of the very good historical reasons that Philo suggests, that culture and language and history are very difficult to escape, but also for reasons of, 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 of wealth. Um, so I, 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 I'm not sure that there is an obvious resonance for Australia that Brexit produces, though I don't, I don't doubt there is some, some consequence. 
I think maybe, you know, there's often talk about changes of names and cheeses and wines. Do you think about, you know, well, that's the more punter <laughs> sort of side of it, is that there won't be you know, a, some greater... It, 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 but potentially it's an opportunity to reawaken historical connections. I mean, it might, might be fanciful to have a free movement of people area between Australia and Great Britain. But it, it's no more illogical, apart from the fact of geography, than having one between Liechtenstein and Great Britain or, or, or Poland and Spain. But that's what the EU is. Mm. What do you think on that, Tom? I'll just get a quick answer from you. Yeah, I, I think just um, to, to echo the kind of positive possibilities, you know, Brexit is at least an exercise in imagination, imagining a different sort yeah. of future. Yeah. And I think if you can harness that energy towards positive ends, that's a great thing. Mm. Now, we touched on this earlier at the start, but there seems to be a lot of interest from uh, people tuning in about what this means for the left globally. Um, you know, we, t we touched on it with in terms of losing that working class base, but if you look on a more global sense, is this the start of the demise for left-wing politics and how do they recover from it? So for me, one of the big questions is, or, is, is not to read too much into what's happened in the UK because I think on the Labour side, there has been a huge shift in the party, but also what is fairly widely seen outside of the, the diehard Corbynists um, a very weak leader. Um, I think they overstuffed their manifesto and I think they went to places that nobody expected them to go to. I don't think anybody was looking for free broadband, for example. I don't think many people were looking necessarily for free university education. They want to bring it down from what it currently is. And I think they went for a bit of a free for all. The manifesto is huge. Um, it contains everything but the kitchen sink. And I think the Democrats in the US, for example, will, will study that carefully and see, don't try and offer everything as an alternative, you know? Just try, try and sort of cleave something closer to what seems doable. A lot has been made into the, the similar situation in Australia, though, that, you know, as you were saying before, inner city elites taking over the left and, mm -hmm. and not speaking to a working class base. But you can't really compare it in terms of Corbyn being quite to the left. Bill Shorten wasn't that position at all. Mm. Some of his policies might have been seen as too far left, but it was a very different parallel. So how do you translate that into a result in Australia on the sort of the hit the left has taken at the last federal election here mm. compared to what happened in the UK? I think one of the one of the massive differences here is compulsory voting, for example. That completely changes the game as compared to the UK. You know, you're to a certain extent comparing apples and oranges. Um, but I think, once again, you know, it's just important not to read too much over to the Australian context. But I think there are resonances in terms of when you see traditional Labour voters and, you know, um, constituencies that voted since Labour even began um, turning to the Tories. You know, that is a, a lesson that if you, if you go too far, maybe you will lose voters. But I think it's also a lesson that they, they were ultimately voting to get Brexit done I, don't th I think that was the central issue and not necessarily all of the policy sort of um, promises around that. Philomena, I mean, what do you think about that? How does the left recover from this, both in the UK but on a global sense? What can well, we learn? The left has been going through a crisis for at least the last 20 or 30 years, probably around the same time as the fall of the Berlin Wall. I think what's one of the challenges is to actually decide what it is they're standing for. Mm. Looking, for looking after a traditional, for instance, white working class vote is something that's actually a shrinking uh, percentage of the population for a start. The other issue is just like the Conservative Party had to deal with the Brexit Party and UKIP um, and did it by absorbing many of their and legitimising many of their um, their shibboleths. So also we have the far left, for instance, in many parts of Europe, um, for instance, Spain, Portugal to an extent, definitely Greece, where you have actually a crumbling of the centre and in a sense um, the idea that, you know, to quote Yeats, well, can the centre hold? And I think that the challenge is actually to see if you actually can keep a cent set of centrist, centre-right or centre-left parties within a political party system when you've actually got movements becoming parties such as Syriza, such as Macron's party, um, such as the challenge of um, uh, Marine Le Pen, for instance, in France. So it's, I think it's something we're seeing um, really that you, you aren't actually seeing centrist parties able to deal with the issues or even to understand the challenges. And so you've got attacks on something called globalism, and we even have it here from uh, um, uh, Scott Morrison, for instance, twice recently in his major speeches he made. So I think there has to be really a real reassessment of what the left wants to do and what 
what it wants to achieve. Does it want to stick to humanitarian principles and values, for mm -hmm. instance? And, and I think that's going to be a challenge. Tim, do the Democrats have time for that sort of... Uh, conversation before the, the 2020 US election? Well, no, I, Where I think do they go my straight? reading of it to this point is that they are hoping that Trump, despite trying to impeach him, will stay there and that he will continue to offend and the economy will go into some sort of dive before November of next year. But the, the wider problem, I think my, my colleagues are, uh, 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 are starting to hit on it, is that the, the, the left has a... Ha, the, and the, the left is a very diverse thing yeah. and it's different in each national Absolutely. arena yeah. that we... But as a general observation, let me say that one of the left's problems which Corbyn's debacle illustrates is that their concentration has been economic. The people, there are poor people, he endlessly eulogises about food banks and the, you know, the, and the desperation that people have to live under. And many people feel aspirational, they don't want to be given stuff, free stuff. The notion of free stuff is in any democratic system means somebody else has got to pay for it. Whereas the, the right, particularly in the UK and illustrated in the last election, understand the cultural argument. I think Donald Trump in part understands the cultural argument. I'm not here to make you rich. I'm not here to give you stuff. I'm here to put you back at the center of the culture. I'm about solving, salving your cultural alienation. And the left don't have that language. They think it's all socioeconomic. Um, and the right, and I think Boris Johnson gets this, understand it's about more than that. Tom, you look like you want to jump yeah, in there. I just, I, I just feel that the problem with that message that's often being given now is that it's racially and religiously encoded often, or at least it's heard by a lot of sort of constituencies in that way, and that's very troubling. Can, well, it can, can be. It doesn't have to be that way. And I think we could argue about how far Johnson used, used the dog whistle. I, I think in some ways immigration, this is a problem for the left, that if you're a... a a victim, and I caricature to capture this argument, but if you're a victim of immigration, you're uh, working, you may be an immigrant yourself that's been in a town which has been ignored by the elite, which is subject to what is, what is uh, packaged to them as unchecked immigration. That, that, if you're on the left and your only response to that is that's racist, well then you're never gonna win over those kinds of voters. The left has a job on its hands. Phil, we are coming up to the hour, but we've had a question here from David, and we touched on it in that uh, question, but the change in traditional voting patterns within the UK, mm -hmm. whether that be within class or from the north to the south, mm -hmm. uh, is this a sort of generational shift? Is this where they will align in future elections, mm -hmm. or do you mm -hmm. think this was a sort of, uh, as you say, framed in a different way, whether that be around yeah. Brexit? Yeah. Look, um, it is partly a generation shift as well. We know that people over um, 60 in particular um, voted in favour of Brexit in 2016, and they voted in favour of the Tories um, this time around. Um, as well, and that's well, actually not just this time around. So um, what we know also is that um, because there isn't um, compulsory voting, that young people haven't been coming out in droves, for example, in the Brexit referendum. So there are going to be some generational changes, um, simply as people do get older and less active. But um, another aspect of the generational changes is um, the, the uh, pressure on the welfare state, um, as younger people are seeing that they're going to have to be supporting older people in, for instance, aged care. Mm -hmm. The aged care homes in the UK, like many other parts of the world, are actually staffed almost entirely by those immigrants um, themselves. And so if, in fact, all the immigrants, EU and non-EU immigrants, were to leave the UK tomorrow, you would be left with people literally in their death throes um, in these aged homes. So there are many aspects of the generational issue. I'll, I'll just get a quick answer for you, Tom, if we can give it to about 30 seconds. What do you think about the shift in the changing sort of voting patterns in the UK? Is this a one-off or is this, you know, the new sort of case over there now? I think a lot of the people who, you know, held their noses who are Labour voters and voted for Tories this time are going to return in the next election when Brexit mm. is no longer That's an okay. issue. Um, but That's I think, the anti-Corbyn. Yeah, the biggest long-term question is how do you get young people to vote? That's it. Final, we'll final observation yeah. from you there, right. Well, that is uh, it for our live stream, uh, Britain Has Voted, Now What? So I would like to thank Professor Philomena Murray, uh, Associate Professor Tim Lynch and Dr Tom Daly for their insights and their expertise as they've picked apart the result on this seismic election. And thank you all for joining us here at the University of Melbourne. Goodbye. <laughs>